Hello, Dr. Simon Freilich, back with the Clinical Neurophysiology channel. I'm sorry it's been a little while since I made the last video, but this subject has been so fascinating, it's just taken me longer. So melatonin um, is going to be the subject of this video. Our light clock and is it all that it's cracked up to be? There's a lot to say about this because there are so many functions associated with melatonin. It's widely distributed across all sorts of different uh, living matter and creatures, whether it's bacteria, plants, animals, and it can have a multitude of roles and expression even within a single organism, whether in humans, for example, gut, bone, skin, retina, placenta, and the list goes on. And I'm going to be focusing in very much on its role in human sleep signaling and synchronization of the circadian rhythms across the various organs. So by overview, how do we sense the natural light cycle? What are the network and signaling pathways involved? What happens in impairments, sleep disorders, and jet lag? Human function is optimized for daytime activity. And when it gets dark, we stop moving, we close our eyes and we fall asleep. And dark and our perception of the light cycle are very important drivers for sleep to occur. So how and why does darkness do this? Let's look at the eye to begin with. So light falls um, onto the back of the eye to the retina. It's made of multiple different layers within a very short uh, distance of just half a millimeter. And uh, we've got the rods and cones at the back of the eye. It's a little bit like the sensor on a camera. It provides the picture really uh, the, of what's going on. Um, and those signals move the way forward through to the retinal ganglion cell layer and then onto the optic nerve and then back to the, the visual uh, processing uh, parts of the brain. Now about 1% of these ganglion cells are actually dedicated um, to light sensing. So they are actual light sensors. And they've got their own um, pigment called melanopsin, which uh, transduces that light signal into an electrical signal. And then it makes its way to its own processing areas within the brain. Now, of course, the rods and cones do provide some um, light on and off uh, sensation as well, but primarily it's coming from the retinal ganglion cells. Now this uh, signaling pathway is called the retinohypothalamic tract, which makes its way to the suprachiasmic nucleus, which sits above the optic chiasm over here. Uh, as another uh, depiction of it over there. Um, and what happens is, is that signal then moves from the suprachiasmic nucleus to the paraventricular nucleus, which then makes its signal known to the pineal gland, which then releases melatonin. And that melatonin makes its way through the CSF to various sensors within the brain and then also to uh, the rest of the body too. Now, not all light is the same. We know it varies by color, by intensity. We know in the mornings and in the evenings, light has a uh, yellowy orange uh, low level glow. And then as we move into towards midday, it becomes bluer, it becomes more intense. And in fact, these retinal ganglion cells are particularly sensitive to blue light um, from actually relatively low levels of about 30 lux. And so what happens is when the light comes through, it stimulates the suprachiasmic nuclei to um, release GABA, which is uh, ironically the inhibitor of the brain, which then acts on the paraventricular nucleus, which signals the pineal gland to reduce the melatonin levels. And in low light uh, situations and darkness, there's um, a secretion of glutamate, which acts on the paraventricular nucleus to signal the pineal gland to increase the melatonin levels and, and to, to release them. And that is how um, the, the circuit is working. And of course, and I've talked about this uh, in a separate video, blue light uh, could be very disruptive to um, our ability to fall asleep. And this is the reason why, because you're going to have suppression of melatonin. Now, that pathway, which I've just said rather glibly, is anything but straightforward, because although the suprachiasmic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus are in very close proximity to each other, the pineal gland, firstly, is on the other side of the ventricle, and the actual pathway does not go from A to B directly. Actually, it goes all the way down through the brainstem, through the cervical and upper thoracic cord, out to the uh, sympathetic uh, nervous system in the superior cervical ganglion um, and then through circulatory release of noradrenaline or norepinephrine if you're in the state which then signals the pineal gland to uh, produce and secrete the melatonin so 
um, that pathway is anything but straightforward. And there are some really interesting and fascinating questions as to why this should be the case. But actually, when you think about it um, and, and discover a little bit more, you'll realize that actually there are lots of connections between the paraventricular nucleus to various centers uh, within the brainstem itself, um, which are important for um, communication with both the cardiovascular system, respiratory system, and the gut um, as well. And also, even within the superior cervical ganglion, there are connections to the um, carotid artery, uh, which is very important in terms of blood pressure uh, sensation, and also down um, into the actual um, thoracic uh, portions of the sympathetic nervous system and signaling to the heart as well. So there are multiple points by which the light signal is actually being communicated to centers other than the pineal gland. So a lesion anywhere across this pathway can cause uh, problems and circadian rhythm impairment. So people who've got visual problems, whether it's within the retina or within the optic nerve, whether there are issues around the hypothalamus, brainstem, spinal cord, the sympathetics, uh, or the pineal gland itself. So let's just focus a little bit now on some of the less obvious things. So let's talk about beta blockers. Now, there's a range of cardiovascular diseases from which uh, patients can benefit from taking these particular types of medications, whether it's hypertension, people who've got arrhythmias, coronary artery disease, or um, congestive heart failure. Um, and there are different types of these um, sympathetic uh, nervous system blockers. And we know that sleep disturbances are relatively common in quite a few of them obviously with some exceptions and we can see as well when we do experimental studies that melatonin levels tend to fall when there is very specific beta adrenal receptor blockades and that's what this graph over here is showing that on particularly with the beta um, receptor uh, blockade propanol atenolol the melatonin levels go down and this is the, the fascinating thing with carvedilol which has both alpha and beta it is untouched um, but we know that if there's a selective beta blockade we know that melatonin levels can fall and in fact there have been various studies which have looked at supplementation um, of melatonin in these um, situations and um, both in terms of polysomnography there is improvement of sleep quality and sleep time and also on longer term um, actigraphy studies as well there is an increase in sleep time and sleep efficiency on those who have received supplementation so um, we, we will appreciate that sleep disturbances are unpleasant um, and we all understand that sleep disturbances can exacerbate cardiovascular disease. There's also plenty of research looking into the antioxidant effects, the anti-inflammatory effects, um, the uh, role in lipid metabolism of melatonin. So it helps to reduce down um, levels of uh, harmful cholesterol and also in terms of blood pressure regulation too. And so there are some very reasonable questions to be asked as to whether or not uh, melatonin uh, reduces cardiovascular disease and whether it affects our outcomes of cardiovascular disease, whether melatonin suppression could potentially make things worse, and would long-term supplementation with melatonin in those who are undergoing suppression via beta blockers, uh, whether that's effective or safe, um, and to be honest with you, having tried to research this, to me at least, it seems unclear. And I think that further information um, is required. And you know, sometimes it can work for some people and may not work for other people. And perhaps it's all these different alternative pathways and networks, some of which we are aware of, some of which we may, are still probably as yet unaware of, may actually reduce the impact of what supplementation can do. We know with aging that uh, the pineal gland, which produces and secretes the melatonin, calcifies with age. We know that melatonin levels decrease with age. So um, this is what this graph over here is showing. This is the amount of then the bloodstream reduces with age. And we also know that sleep quality reduces with age. And it's very attractive to say, well, we go from point A to B to C that the pineal gland is becoming dysfunctional as it calcifies, melatonin le the levels decrease because of that, and therefore sleep quality um, reduces uh, with age. Now, does supplementation work? So 
people have looked at this, um, and this is from the American Association of Sleep Medicine. Um, they haven't found any particularly striking benefit um, of using melatonin in those who've got chronic insomnias. Um, some would suggest perhaps that it's to do with the quality of the melatonin, a very fascinating paper uh, looking at how much melatonin is in the melatonin be that's being supplied because most people are buying this as a health supplement and because it's a supplement it's not produced the same um, sort of medical grade as a, as a medicine would be. So only about a third um, of over-the-counter uh, melatonin um, is actually supplied at the dosage on the label. So it can either be less than or more than. And so there is a question as to whether or not too high of a level um, could uh, negate its effects. Some would hypothesize that. Um, but actually, um, when we start looking at some other uh, spheres as well, so let's say in the intensive care patients, so we know that um, lots of intensive care patients will complain of poor sleep quality in an intensive care unit, um, the very noisy places, uh, the lights are often uh, on during the night when there are emergencies, uh, which you know, more often than not. So there are all, all sorts of reasons why sleep can be impaired in an intensive care unit. Uh, and it's been looked at as to whether or not melatonin supplementation makes any uh, positive effect. And there wasn't anything convincing uh, that has been found thus far. Additionally, seasonal affective disorder, uh, where you know, there's some you know, quite good hypotheses as to why melatonin should be um, beneficial um, in this condition, again, has not found any profound significant uh, beneficial effects um, in large reviews. High spinal cord injury. So we've, we've talked about the pathway making its way through the um, spinal cord. And in fact, yes, melatonin levels will decrease in these scenarios, but actually supplementation has been looked at and hasn't had any convincing uh, benefits in terms of uh, sleep time. And so this is the, the caveat emptor, the buyer beware of the melatonin story in that whilst a deficiency might be an attractive pharmaceutical target for replacement, it does not necessarily equate to the desired effect being achieved and there may also be some unexpected side effects so uh, we know that it can uh, potentiate it can can increase the effects of some medicines such as uh, warfarin uh, for reasons that we don't currently fully understand and the manufacturers have said um, to avoid its use in those with autoimmune disease liver and kidney disease as well so it's important to discuss usage with your doctor particularly if, if you're thinking about this for long-term use and i would refer to the nhs website for um, some more information on this now one thing which is clear that in terms of short-term use uh, for getting over jet lag when you're going in an eastwards direction so where the uh, nighttime is coming earlier um, so it can be very beneficial to reduce uh, jet lag uh, particularly if you're crossing uh, more than five time zones um, when it's less than that it becomes less certain but it can reduce the time um, and it's quite understandable why they should should be for people to get over their jet lag because they're able to get to sleep sooner in a more sustained way um, and therefore acclimatized to the new time period. So it's a very important hormone. It has many roles. Its real world effects are not as well as understood as perhaps some of the papers would suggest. Um, and I think that the extent of the supplemental networks um, involved and also perhaps age-related sensitivity as well, maybe part of that. And so the effects of replacement and supplementation, uh, which do seem to be quite variable, are a little bit uncertain. And so it's a really remarkable and fascinating uh, subject, uh, and one which I think is still an open uh, book, really, in terms of where we're going to be going with it. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed watching that and uh, look forward to seeing you in the next series of videos. All the very best.